Uh, there are many theories regarding man's outcome if the insect world were to turn on him. All I can tell you is that in none of them do we come out on top. Welcome back to Mind Over Splatter. My name is Dylan. I'm drinking an egg cream. Can we start? <laughs> no joke. I had a fucking egg cream ready. No way. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not restarting. I like this. <laughs> it's my movie. You stole my joke from my fucking movie. You can't start with that. I was going to use that when I actually started with my movie. Like later in the episode. <laughs> I can't believe we both had that idea. I was also going to break it out when we got to that movie. I was too excited. <laughs> You're the worst. I was going to pour bourbon into mine. I was just about to do Oh, it. yeah. Well, whatever. It's my first time tasting this insane concoction that I've never heard of. Did you use the actual Hershey's? It's not Hershey's. It's like no-name chocolate sauce that I have. Is that what you have? No, I got the one that's shaped like a bunny. Hey, it's not bad. It's- I know. It's good. I bought this shit before I was going to watch it because I knew there was a weird drink in it with was club soda, chocolate milk, and that Hershey cream. <laughs> Fuck you. Everybody's going to be very confused, but it has a connection to one of our movies. My movie. <laughs> Otherwise, how's it going, Sheldon? Pretty rotten now. I guess I'll go to my Voodoo Ranger IPA from Etobicoke, Ontario. Okay. Sorry, I really didn't mean to put a worm in your egg cream. Will, how's it going? Why do you guys always fight on the holidays? <laughs> oh, I'm doing fine, uh, despite you guys going at it. <laughs> I'm drinking the, actually, uh, something I bought for the Kaiju episode, but that was not a non-drinking episode. So I got Sonic Sea Dragon, an IPA from uh, Odin Brewing Co. out of Vancouver. Today's topic is 1970s killer bug movies. So we're covering movies from 1974 to 1978, killer insect movies. A couple of them are not technically insects, so that's why I'm going with killer bugs, killer creepy crawlies, natural Mm. horror from that period. We've got six movies that we're going to go through one at a time and dissect. Bug horror, in some ways, it seems kind of like a natural topic for a horror movie because a lot of people are instinctively creeped out by bugs. They kind of exist at a liminal space between animals and just some raw manifestation of nature i always get somewhat uneasy about seeing bugs killed in these movies Um, not because i'm the world's biggest bug lover it is odd eh? i felt the same thing yeah and i think that really speaks to the way that bugs occupy that kind of uneasy territory in our mind between being animals and not quite being animals like we don't accord them the same respect we would mammals and birds and fish and other vertebrates they are animals but they're somehow some force that's just of nature that's just of the earth and it makes us uneasy for obvious reasons uh beyond that just bugs are often an indicator of uncleanliness or disease or something so i think there's very deep rooted reasons why people are often creeped out by them and this comes under the natural horror umbrella which we had a big resurgence of natural horror in the late 1970s so a fear of the natural world or at least an uneasiness of our place in the natural world and these movies often kind of shade into another big late 70s movie category which is disaster movies especially one in particular that we'll get to pretty soon but these revenge of nature movies from the 70s seem to be a kind of hybrid of hippie-ish environmental concerns that were on the rise in the time and the reactionary impulses of disaster movies that idea of defending your family and your traditional way of life in the face of a rapidly changing and chaotic and scary world it's kind of a very 1970s hybrid to have uh, environmental concerns and this kind of reactionary disaster movie thing tied together. And um, you guys might have assumed, or Sheldon might have assumed anyways, from doing the animals episode, I have prepared some spicy bug facts. And as a special surprise, I've conducted an interview with bee expert, professor and author Mark L. Winston who, when these movies were being made, was doing seminal work on killer bees in South America. Actually, in, uh, I believe it was July of 1976 or 77, we were the cover story in Rolling Stone magazine. You know, they sent a reporter down to um, investigate the killer bees and the killer bee team. So, you know, we had a lot of fun. 
So we're going to be hearing a lot more from Mark L. Winston when we start diving into the killer bee hysteria a bit later in the episode. So I'm going to lead things off by talking about Phase 4 from 1974, a really unique and strange movie. Uh, Just to kind of set the table here, I'd like to go a little bit more in depth on what I was talking about, about the rise of environmental concerns, because I think environmentalism is really a backdrop for this movie trend from the 70s. Um, The modern environmental movement is often said to have started in 1962 with the publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, but it really got taking off in like 1969, 70, 71, 72, around that period where you had the Endangered Species Act was created, Earth Day was created, Greenpeace was founded. Uh, So around the very end of the 60s and start of the 70s, you had this huge collective consciousness about environmental issues. And I think that's kind of the wellspring from which we see these movies. And I think that there's a couple strains you can tease out of it in terms of where it came from. So one thing is space exploration. You had the moon landing in 1969. In 1972, you had the publication of the first like full color photo of Earth as seen from space taken by the astronauts on Apollo 17, which was known as the blue marble photo and became one of the most widely disseminated images of all time. So these things together allowed people to see themselves as living on the planet, as a species on the face of the planet. So you could imagine an extraterrestrial intelligence looking down at the Earth as you see a photo like this or see footage of the moon landing and see us as just animals that live on this blue marble. Also, at the same time, there was a growing awareness of the possibility that there might be levels of consciousness in nature itself. And a lot of this was tied up in research on whales, which people started to realize are maybe actually quite smart. In 1969, John C. Lilly uh, wrote The Mind of the Dolphin, which was a huge bestseller about how dolphins are actually really smart. This was a little bit before Lily started going off the deep end, and he eventually started getting really into LSD and started giving LSD to dolphins and had his assistants jerk off the dolphins while he tried to communicate with them telepathically. But he wasn't that crazy quite yet in 1969, and The Bite of the Dolphin was a huge bestseller. Another big part of that was that there was an album called Songs of the Humpback Whale that in 1970 was placed in every issue of National Geographic magazine. And National Geographic had a huge circulation at that time. So people had just discovered that whales have songs too. So again, we're imagining that whales as kind of these emissaries of the natural world are actually really smart creatures. A fun fact about the song of the Humpback Whales album is that it's been said that it had a bigger pressing than any other album ever. One music record that isn't held by like Elvis or the Beatles, but by some random whale somewhere. (laughs) So put these two things together. We can see humans as a species on Earth from above and from below. We can imagine a consciousness looking at us from space or looking up from us from the depths of the sea. We can imagine that other animals can see us and that maybe they can judge us and that we probably wouldn't get a passing grade. There's a lot of concern at this point that we're trashing the planet and that anybody from the outside that could look in at us as a species and not just as like a country or a group of people would would be be very upset about our handling of the planet. I think we're doing doing fine. We're killing it. So I think that's the, the backdrop for phase four, which is a really environmentally inflected movie. Think of the society, James, with perfect harmony. Perfect altruism and self-sacrifice. Perfect division of labor. So defenseless in the individual. So powerful in the mass. So 1974, as I mentioned, Phase 4 was directed by Saul Bass, the only movie that Saul Bass ever directed. You might not know... Saul Bass is named as a filmmaker because he just did one movie. But if you're a film fan, you're likely familiar with his work. The Man with the Golden Arm, Vertigo, Anatomy of a Murder, Seconds. These are all some classic movies that have iconic opening title sequences that were done by Saul Bass. He was kind of the master of opening title sequences. Most known for that. Also poster design. He did iconic posters for Psycho, Vertigo, Golden Arm. Oh, nice. 
Yeah, so a hugely important graphic designer on the look of like cool films and was involved in the in films in other ways too. Like in the film Grand Prix, he staged and directed and edited all the racing scenes, which are fantastic. And he storyboarded and according to some people anyways, came up with the whole concept of the shower scene in Psycho. Mm-hmm. So it had a huge impact on film history, despite the fact that he only ever made one movie himself, and it's kind of an obscure film about ants. So if he, anybody who hasn't seen it is wondering what this great graphic artist's movie would look like, uh, well, a lot of it kind of looks like it could be like prog rock album covers. There's a lot of like geometrical structures in the desert and then close-ups of insects. Those happen in every one of these movies. Yeah, you have those very 70s visuals mm-hmm. of people at like control panels in like metallic <laughs> geometrical structures, often wearing like hazmat suits and looking very concerned. So less of a horror or disaster movie this way, and more of like a weird philosophical experiment. Um, ants have become, or at least some ants have become super intelligent. It's implied that some extraterrestrial force did this, though it, nothing is clearly explained. Uh, two scientists are sent out to the American desert to study a colony of ants who have erected these strange geometric towers. And as they study the ants in the middle of the desert, they start to realize that maybe the ants are studying them and the ants lay siege to them. And they start to realize that the ants are perhaps playing psychological experiments on them. It's a very strange and kind of simple movie, and it's set up in execution. And then, of course, the movie ends with a montage of psychedelic imagery that is incredible stuff that I love. I should say the movie, as it's been restored, ends with that montage, because Saul Boss's original final montage for Phase 4 was cut out for the theatrical release, and it was believed to be lost. It was just in 2012 that somebody discovered the original final montage from phase four and restored it to the film. And it's unbelievable that was cut out of the theatrical release. I wonder if I saw that. How, how did it go? Since it's like a psychedelic montage, it it doesn't exactly have like a plot, but there's like scenes of the guy is like naked at some point. He like meets up with a girl and then you see like a sun rising in his chest and the sun glowing through his hand. Oh, I didn't see that one. No, no, I didn't. I didn't watch that version. You missed out. It's trippy shit. It gets really trippy at the end it's hard to say what the movie is trying to accomplish but the fact that the ants you know spoiler alert which should not be much of a spoiler do kind of take over some of the humans near the end is not necessarily a horror moment it's ambivalent at worst but may also be uh, an extremely hopeful and uplifting moment of humans finding a greater sense of purpose or maybe achieving a higher destiny of being life on earth in a way that is more responsible and thoughtful, potentially. It's kind of like the ending of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and that is not too clear what's going on. You're not Mm. too sure if you should be anxious about this or if you should feel really hopeful and excited about it. I do think 2001, now that I've mentioned it, is maybe um, its influence can be felt on the film in the, the visual language a bit and kind of the slow, thoughtful approach that it takes to its surroundings that kind of um, induces a sort of almost a philosophical reflection on the part of the audience. Uh, another movie I thought of was Silent Running, which was also a very environmentally inflected movie mm-hmm. that came out a couple of years after 2001 by Douglas Turnbell, who I've also worked on 2001 though phase four is not as sentimental as that it has more of the kind <laughs> of the frigid kubrickian character of 2001 uh, i also thought of the man who fell to earth a lot while i was watching this too um, it is a movie i like it's a movie that kind of sticks in a corner of your head and as you would expect from assault bass the visual language is very assured and commanding and the macro photography of the ants is really great too there's lots Mm. of extreme close-ups of ants going about ant business at some points it even gets like almost gets moving at points too there's one point where the ants have all the dead ants lined up like soldiers like in gone with the wind or and it's it's kind of moving to see all these dead ants lined up and this carnage that their society has had to endure ken middleham did the photography of the ants he also did the movie um the hellstrom chronicle a few years earlier in 1971 which is a weird kind of mix of science fiction and documentary that also involves tons of insect photography. 
yeah, I was really interested in finding out like how long people have been able to do these kind of close up shots of insects in motion like we have in things like planet Earth and stuff now, because I felt like yeah. oh, 1974, that's pretty early for that. So I started looking into it. Do you guys want to guess when the first documentary that had like close up shots of live insects? Do you want to guess what year that came out in? Uh, I'll throw 61. Oh, I was going to go way earlier. I was going to go like 50s. 09, 1909. There was an Englishman named F. Percy Smith who between 1909 and 1925 made a series of short films about ants and flies and spiders. So um, yeah, that tradition goes back a lot longer than I would have thought it had. But yeah, that, that, that amazing footage of ants that Ken Middleham handled is part of what makes uh, Phase 4 um, really fascinating visually. And uh, different from the other movies that we're going to talk about, but a really striking and strange oddity. It does seem like it was kind of uh, betrayed by its poster, because the poster is a lot more grindhousey, where it's like the ant coming out of a hand. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's more suffering, and it, you know, it seems to have closer relation to something like Maniac than 2001. There's something to be said about how posters can really sometimes betray a film. Yeah. I think the producers definitely did not know what to do with this, which is why they chopped off the ending, which is horrifying because that's like <laughs> a masterpiece by this great uh, artist of editing. But obviously they, they thought they could market it as a horror film because they had no idea what else to do with it. And it's sad because phase four was a total bomb and Saul Bass never made another movie. I understand why it was a bomb. That's for sure. It's yeah, it's too fucking weird. It's not the most popcorn friendly movie for sure. No. If you want to see one of the finer examples of a poster ruining a film, look up the poster for the movie The Last Detail, starring Jack Nicholson. Oh, I, I don't know the poster, but I love that movie. It's a great movie. Look at the poster and you will realize, oh yes, I can see how this doomed it. It really gives a completely wrong image. Like I'm hoping everyone out there in listening land is going to treat themselves to seeing what should be a poster for a, you know, a little military kind of dramedy. And instead, they're looking at what is clearly the cover for some rough boy gay porn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, misleading as fuck. Yeah, I'm so mad at that poster because it's a great movie and it bombed because of the poster, I swear. <laughs> Anyways, yes, Psychedelic Ants. Uh, yeah, you're right. The macro footage is outstanding on it. Like like the examining back and forth, the you know humans staring at them, them staring back, and you get those little head tilt. There's like a bit of expression. And ants have like one of the more for lack of a better term, basic, like they are like an archetypal insect face. There's no like multitude of eyes or strange, like a kid's outline drawing. Like, what is a bug face? There you go. And, hmm. and yet from that, you get this weird bit of expression. Like you actually have it emoting for lack of a better term. I know I'm not going to grant ants emotions, but it, it came through in this film. Yeah, yeah. The fact that their heads they're very mobile, and you yeah. mentioned you know, they are always tilting their heads back and forth, so it's easy for us to project emotion onto mm -hmm. this recognizable face that's kind of tilting around a little bit. The scene where they set a trap for the pragmatists, <laughs> I really like the way that's executed. We've got one ant sneaking up from behind, like oh surprise! You guys want some bug facts? I'm sure it doesn't matter. I'm giving them to you anyways. <laughs> uh, the The structures of the colony are like obviously not like ant colonies and they're geometric. So they're not like any insect colonies, but there might be a lot of termite mounds, which are incredible works of architecture. You know, those huge termite mounds like they have in Africa and stuff, huge towers yep. that can be like 10 feet tall. And they're built with a series of apertures that are designed to work with the winds and diurnal temperature cycles to facilitate the exchange of gases and ventilate and control the temperature of the structure. And no one knows how termites manage to do this, like how thousands and thousands of termites, each moving grains of sand independently of one another, can somehow end up coordinating to have this structure happen. But somehow it, it works out. Quick ant <laughs> fact that I really like. Ants have like an internal pedometer. It's been shown that ants count how many steps they take. And that's how they know how far it is to get, yeah. say, from a source of food to the colony. Hmm. And we know that they count their steps because <laughs> researchers have placed little stilts on ants and amputated some other ants' limbs. And then the ants that have longer legs than they normally do end up overshooting their destination and the ants with shorter legs end up falling that short. That sounds so mean. <laughs> the amputation part sounds mean. The little stilt sounds kind of fun. Yeah. But <laughs> they will only get it wrong the first time. 
the second time they learn their lesson and they account for the change in their limb length. They account the correct <laughs> number of steps, but they don't just use this to find their way around. It's been shown they use optical flow so they can keep track of the movement of objects around them to position themselves. Mm. They use the position of the sun to orient themselves. And some ants seem to use magnetic fields and perhaps the polarization of light from the sun to place themselves. So they have a very developed sense of direction and location better than we do. No, yeah, outrageous. Pretty crazy stuff. Well, I get lost walking home from work, so. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some more ants. Come on, more ants, more ants. Sheldon, give us more, more ants. All right, yes. let's get into, uh, actually, before we get into my movie, I was, gonna, I was just going to say how much I genuinely like this subgenre of horror movies. Hmm. That's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah I, I like them all. <laughs> I, li- I actually liked every movie we watched tonight. Oh, oh yeah. sweet. I feel like that's going to be a very rare thing. I all. think so too. <laughs> I, I really like this subgenre. Well, cheers to that. I'm going to finish my egg cream and bourbon. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> we'll keep the ant theme going. Let's do with, it. With uh, a movie I really enjoyed called Ants with an exclamation mark. Love it when a movie has an exclamation mark. AKA it happened at Lakewood Manor. AKA panic at Lakewood Manor. Three very good titles. Yeah. What, your favorite is Ants with the exclamation mark? Mm, I know. I think I got to go with the two Lakewoods. It's hard to pick between them, but I think I'd go with Panic at Lakewood Manor. Yeah. Though it, it's Just, hard to it's hard to dismiss the exclamation mark. But imagine if they put Panic exclamation mark at Lakewood Manor. Sounds pretty emo, man. Oh, fuck it does. <laughs> Never mind. I'll just stick with Ants. So Ants, 1977, made for TV movie. We've got a couple of those. The picnic is ruined. That's what the cover says. <laughs> <laughs> Which made me laugh when I saw it because it's so yeah. stupid. Uh, this one stars, I think, a whole bunch of people. But the only recognizable one to me was Suzanne Summers, And it's set around a resort hotel next to some construction site that digs up a huge ass ant nest. The ants are described as highly venomous due to being built over like a sewage dump. Chemicals leaked into these ants. Some weird like that. And then from there... Uh, the people start dying off, and we got our heroine trying to figure out how this is happening, trying to prove the fact that these ants are doing it. That's what he goes, fuck you guys. If you don't believe me, I hope I'm wrong, and digs up the nest and fucking releases it on the entire population. <laughs> and then goes into the Lakewood Manor and goes, oh. <laughs> and then he's locked in there with the ants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get to the last act in which there's the small group of people trapped inside the Lakewood Manor. With the ants swarming in and pushing them like from floor one to floor two to four, three up to the roof, and just having them try and survive the uh, the attack before they get saved. And then there's a whole bunch of outside people trying to like figure out ways to get them out. And so there's three specific ways in which they thought to get these people out of the ant attack. All three ways worked perfectly fine, despite after every one they're scrapping the, the idea completely and trying something new. I think idea one was the uh, like fire truck with the ladder. The guy driving it, I guess, ha- doesn't know how to work it, and she almost dies. And then they fly in a helicopter, which is the best idea. They like, load everyone up in this fucking helicopter and get them out. They put the one granny in there from the wheelchair. They scoop her out. And then as the helicopter is landing, it blows ants all over everyone. They scrap that idea. Instead of just fa- saying, like, fuck everyone, how about all you fans watching? Just back up and let the helicopter fly back in, scoop up the remaining people, there's only three left at this point, and save them. But anyways, they move on to idea three, which is, oh, this one was an accident. The guy fell out the window onto a... Or like an awning. Yeah, he falls on there, you know, and then gets scooped up and he leaves. He, he leaves by jumping into a bulldozer. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> alive saw this. Why didn't they just hop there and then hop in the bulldozer and leave? Anyway, those are the three ideas they come up with. and <laughs> But throughout this entire process, I fucking love this movie. Me um, too. I had, a, I had a good time. Like, every death was so overdramatic. When the little boy gets attacked by ants, he's outside of a garbage bin and fucking high jumps into the garbage bin as he gets bit. <laughs> every other character gets bit and they, like, slowly, like, scream in pain and dramatically fall over. I found the deaths really interesting and, and and just funny. I really enjoyed the mix of high tension moments like you've just described 
most of them, but I, I thought it was really creative how they kept coming up with these different, very unique situations <laughs> for the characters to be in. I really enjoyed that part of it. Like the final high tension moment involves the characters just keeping very still, like the opposite of like an action climax. I forgot to mention that while they, very breathe through still, tubes. while they breathe through tubes, while ads crawl all over them. I like that moment. Just yet another inventive, creative it, yeah. situation that the screenwriter, who is a Gordon Trueblood, uh, had his characters go through. Got to give a shout out to Myrna Loy. Yeah, she plays the old woman. Uh, yeah, special appearance by... So I, I didn't know the, who these people were. Uh, she's one of my favorite actresses out of, especially her work in the 30s, most famous for the uh, the Thin Man series. It's Nick and Nora, that namesake became quite famous, where it's her and William Powell as this sort of well-to-do couple that kind of inadvertently solve mysteries, and it's just delightful. Another thing about this movie, and basically all these movies, I like how they use like real insects while filming mm-hmm. it adds something something good yeah. rather than watching like i don't know like a cgi snake for 90 minutes like no one's scared of that shit like when you're watching the actor the three actors at the end like they're covered in real ants just another day at the office because you know they're sitting through this and not enjoying it maybe you can see it on their face too that's that's not acting that's probably real like fuck i want this scene to be over oh for sure <laughs> <laughs> i wonder how many takes they did like, you, you couldn't do many, right? Like in Candyman, where the guy, where Tony Todd opens his mouth, and we have all those live bees flowing out of it. Mm-hmm. Like, imagine how much shittier that would have been if it was CGI. Oh, yeah. How could a horror movie with live bees possibly go wrong? Impossible. It could never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess we'll find out. But yeah, I really like this one. Mm, better, yeah. than, better than Phase 4. Phase 4 is just a little weird for me. Yeah, it's a different type of movie. This is more oh, yeah. like a exciting horror movie, but uh, I enjoyed this too. Like I thought the script was really strong because of the mix of, of situations, but also the mix of characters I thought was good. There's this big diversity of different character mm-hmm. types that all get trapped in together. So it's kind of that classic disaster movie thing where you have like a bunch of characters for, with opposing viewpoints and different jobs and from different social situations who all end up trapped together trying to get out of a situation. Kind of like an Irwin Allen disaster movie. That's same kind of vibe so the blend of natural horror and action movie is strong in this one we also get the environmental stuff too like we do pretty much all of these there's a message that it's like it's not their fault they're not like evil rampaging animals as there are in other types of natural horror the scientist guy he had a bunch of quotes like relating us to them i still remember exactly what they were well i've got a couple loaded down that i wanted to to oh nice all right good yeah, like one line he says, like, we're the ones that force them to live in a toxic world. Why should we be surprised if they use it on us? You often have that message in these movies, right? Of like, it's not their fault, it's our fault. We've spoiled the world, and it's only right that the world gets revenge on us. We have to somehow return to balancing it. And then uh, right at the very end, somebody says about, you know, destroying the ant nest, break up the nest, it scatters. Same as with people. Mm -hmm. that's the final message so i think that also kind of goes back to what i was talking about earlier how there's that hybrid of having the kind of hippie-ish environmental message but also the fundamentally reactionary disaster movie message of defending the family they're merged together in one thing like protecting the planet and not having it go awry by putting toxic chemicals into it and stuff is allied with returning to a more traditional way of life and defending it from the changes that are happening in the world socially and culturally, um, not just environmentally. And I think it's interesting that in these 70s movies, those go hand in hand, which won't be the case when you get to movies in like the 90s and stuff where pro-environmental messages and like more reactionary pro-family messages often just won't mix. Like those are two different types of movies. But in these 70s movies, I think they're kind of going hand in hand. And I find that pretty interesting as a kind of a time capsule of cultural interests then. Yeah, extremely true, which it, and it'll continue to be true as we go through the rest of these films. We'll find that. Mm-hmm. How about one bonus ant fact, since we got another ant movie? One more. Yeah, one more. Yeah, bonus not? ant fact. Um, ants leave scent trails. You probably already knew that, right? They leave scent trails to find their food. So they, they communicate with scents, with pheromones a lot. 
But um, they do more than just use scent trails with this. Fun things that I found out. They also have, you might have known that they have alarm pheromones. That's the thing where, like, if you crush an ant, its glands will send out an alarm signal. So other members of the colonies will know there's a threat. Go attack. (laughs) But at least some species of ants can produce what's called propaganda pheromones. And what that (laughs) means is when one ant colony is attacking another ant colony, they can strategically release scents that cause the enemy to become confused or disoriented and start attacking each other. Those are propaganda hmm. pheromones. Huh. That, that was pretty cool. All right, two ant movies in the books. Both fun, both entertaining. What, what bug do you want to serve us? I don't know if it should build up to... I mean, it'd probably be a bit too soon for Swarm. It's a... Uh... There's a lot of strong feelings. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with Kingdom of the Spiders. Mm, nice. Which uh, made for a very interesting watch because for a bit there we thought we were still doing a, a vast field of eras of bug movies. So I had just finished watching, rewatching rather, Arachnophobia and then realized, oh, I got to go to the 70s. So I went right into Kingdom of the Spiders. And there's so much lended from one to the other. To the point that I found out that they'd asked the director of Kingdom of the Spiders if he considered suing the makers of Arachnophobia. And he said, well, you just simply don't sue Steven Spielberg. But that's not what we're talking about now. Although we are definitely talking about a post-Jaws cinematic world where, you know, nature on the rampage is uh, the film du jour of the late 70s. But here we have uh, William Shatner in a starring role. And boy, howdy, is it ever a William Shatner film. Just the, the performance is just oozing confusion. Like you just, you cannot get a read on him. You never can. You never will. He's in his 90s, and we're not going to start figuring him out now. But, uh, yes, we got the story of a, a dusty little town where everyone's just kind of minding their own business. Everybody's pleasant. You really sympathize with every single character. And then all of a sudden, some cattle start dying, and they worry that it might have to do with a, a virus. So they're considering quarantining them. And it becomes this whole panic. There's a lot of discussions about how that would financially ruin them. Definitely hits uh, hard right now watching this, thinking about how many businesses are shutting down as the result of a pandemic. And so I found myself nodding and agreeing like, yes, you quarantine uh, now, then you might not recover. But uh, lo and behold, it only gets worse because it turns out there's some sort of super form of tarantula that has um, sprung up uh, for no reason. These are just incredibly dangerous spiders that have just formed a mound. Uh, They are acting uh, more like bees in that they are sending out soldiers. They are insanely venomous, very prolific with their webs, and they start killing. And then I could just say that's the whole movie. We just start watching people dying, and then there's the credits. (laughs) That is essentially the... Fucking nailed it. That is basically what Kingdom of the Spiders entails. (laughs) It is just... Horrifying incident after horrifying incident. It doesn't really get better. It just keeps getting worse. Oh, come on. What when does it get better? When when the entire community is turned into one gigantic cocoon? It looked like Christmas. Uh sure, yes. <laughs> yes <laughs> it, it, if you squint your eyes and didn't see the rest of the film leading up to it, you might think, oh, it's a lovely matte painting. We're gonna see William Shatner bopping someone on his knee in a Santa outfit. <laughs> ho, ho. Merry Christmas. 70s films are, they're real downers. And that's a big important theme that we really have to acknowledge here. This one in particular really had a, a glowering sense of pessimism. Mm-hmm. And I don't just say that because of all of the scenes of William Shatner flirting. That was the disaster aspect. You wish you were her. No, no, I don't. (laughs) I don't want to just write it off as like, oh, he's being creepy. No, he was something different. He brought something new, like a brand new poisonous spider that we've never heard of before. (laughs) William Shatner brought a brand of flirting to the table that no one has ever seen. I've never thought about just kidnapping a girl and be like, that'll work. Yeah, he just carjacks the woman that he's hitting on. It worked. It's funny because there are moments there where he is genuinely endearing. He's a caring veterinarian. He has a tragic past. 
that is the story of all these characters. It's like, wow, I've had a lot of troubles, but now I'm in this small town, barely making it. Now I'm dead. Woo, what a life. Yeah, you've got um, Shatner's brother's widow, who's in love with Shatner. And then when she sees him with another woman, she's like, yeah, it, it's fine, Rack. Or his character's named Rack. Rack. Like, yeah. I don't mind. Then goes to her kitchen and starts crying to herself. That's the end of her arc. That's it. Well, yeah, she's, she's what, dead six minutes later? The owner of the diner's waiting for the sheriff because that's like her like long time love and of course then it cuts to a scene of him getting crushed by a water tower because i love how it just from like i wonder how the town's doing cut to the town everyone's covered in spiders and they're either (laughs) on fire jumping through glass getting hit by cars then it goes back to it's like nope haven't heard from them hope it's going okay but that that one pilot who uh of course he gets killed by spiders and an explosion but i love how he had this like an old fashioned insignias on the side of the plane, like you would in World War II. Like every time you knocked on a German plane, you put a stamp on your oh, yeah. on the side. And he's got all these insects. And then just before going up, he draws what we should assume would be a spider, but it's nothing. It's not anything. It has like ten legs. <laughs> it has like one eye. Like he's clearly never seen a spider before, or he's never drawn before, or both. It made the final cut. Clearly, they just, well, he drew it with a permanent marker. We can't fucking undo that. So it's not like we can buy another plane. We don't have a budget. <laughs> it's, on, it's on there for good now. Oh, my God. This insane ten-legged snowman. What about the jaunty hillbilly country that plays in the intro and end credits? Doesn't that get your mood up a little bit? It just All it does is remind me of what the world once was. Oh, yeah, there was music and dancing and friendship. Now it's all just spiders. I do kind of appreciate the melodramatic way in that the scenes are staged and the performances where all the other actors mostly seem to kind of follow Shatner's cues and speak in like drawn out sentences. And the musical score is also really turned up to a dramatic level. So I find it kind of enjoyable the way scenes in like a soap opera are are enjoyable. Mm. Like it has that extreme emotional sensitivity it's like very tuned up to a high emotional key a uh, very b movie and not good but <laughs> like it, it has an enjoyable like overindulgence in its melodrama but uh, i enjoyed it and yeah also shatter's performance is just like even in the 70s i don't think people were finding that charming no it, it's and after he carjacks the woman he takes her to the restaurant and uh, and offers a sarcastic cheers to woman's lib. That's kind of what his whole performance is like, just being like creepy and sarcastic. Well, it's so weird because it bounces between that and like trying to make him incredibly sympathetic. Then he he'll be like very helpful and he's kind to everyone. And you think, oh, he does have this kind of endearing relationship. Like he cares so much about uh, his like niece. He's either pure creep or <laughs> he's like pure hero. It's almost Jekyll and Hyde-esque, where maybe when he takes off his hat, he's like, oh, I'm just a good old Southern boy, and I'm here to help everybody in the community and, you know, marry my best gal. And then he puts on the hat. It's like, well, I'm going to carjack you and take you to a restaurant and make you pay. (laughs) Um, I think in the way it's, like, structured, it reminds me a lot of the birds. Mm-hmm. Not saying that they deserve to be compared on on the same level. Uh, In terms of where the spiders come from, they do kind of give a little bit of lip service very briefly to the idea that it has something to do with DDT. There's very little explanation, but by using DDT, it's kind of convenient shorthand. Because DDT was like the big, a big motivating factor for the early environmentalist movement. The book Silent Spring started from an assignment that Carson had to explore claims that DDT was harming the environment, this pesticide that had become broadly used at that point, and it's often cited as the first big success of the environmental movement when the United States banned DDT use in the 70s and most other countries followed suit. And depending who you ask, it's also been an albatross around the neck of the environmental movement since then because it was the most effective way for killing malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Reading about how this movie was made, I just really enjoyed how they just went out and caught spiders in the region, caught tarantulas. <laughs> I, I read two different stories that kind of conflict, so I'm not sure which one is true. One story I read said that they had Mexicans that they paid $10 for each tarantula they caught. I read that too. Yeah, but another story said they paid local kids $1 for each tarantula they caught. It could be both, I guess. 
But by some estimates, the movie ended up spending like at least a tenth of their budget just paying people for the tarantulas they caught. With all these tarantulas, you'd let them loose at a scene, and then they'd have a bunch of aides standing by with like paper cups. And as soon as they call cut, they have to rush in and put a cup on top of the spider to stop it from running away. And then, of course, you have to keep them somewhere in between takes, but you can't put them all together because tarantulas are cannibals and they would all kill each other if you put them together. So it sounds like it was just a nightmare working with these tarantulas. I could see that, yeah. <laughs> Tarantula fact. Quick one. Most tarantulas are venomous, but none of them have venom that can actually really hurt a person at all. But their main defense is they have little hairs. You might have seen this on like nature documentaries, right? On their abdomens, they have these little hairs that are known as urticating bristles. They're not technically hairs because only mammals have those, but little hair-like filaments. And they rub their back legs against their abdomen and release all these little bristles, these little hairs, towards the threat and it gets stuck in your pores and is extremely irritating. It's kind of like getting fiberglass on your skin. It could get in your eye, too, and that would really... That, that's, that's the big threat, actually, that it gets yeah. in your eyes. Tarantulas, some tarantulas can live up to 40 years. Wow. Yeah, and they can go up to two years without eating. Hmm. Some species. Hmm. So they're, they're pretty durable creatures. All right, let's get into bees, eh? Yeah. Bee time? Let's... Bee time. Bee let's do the bees. Time. Bee boys, let's do it. Killer bees, specifically. Mm. So we've got two bee movies. You like jazz? And this is a big part of killer insect movies from the 70s because there was a killer bee panic in the United States in the 70s. And you know what? I'm going to go into killer bees. I'm going to talk about the killer bee panic. (laughs) I'm here with Mark L. Winston, professor and senior fellow at the Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University and author of most recently Listening to the Bees, as well as the Governor General's Award-winning Bee Time, Lessons for the Hive, and of special interest to us, Killer Bees, the Africanized honeybee in the Americas. Always a pleasure to talk about killer bees. (laughs) For us as well. Can you just explain what exactly a killer bee or an Africanized honeybee is? Uh, In 1956, a Brazilian professor brought over a number of uh, queens of African honeybees. He went to Africa, collected some queens, brought them to Brazil in the hopes of creating a better tropical honeybee for South America. Unfortunately, 26 swarms escaped before they could do any breeding, and they established the nucleus of a feral population, which has since spread throughout most of Latin America and into the southern, most of the southern United States. They are technically African bees because they're quite similar to the subspecies of bee that was introduced. Honeybees evolved in both Europe and Africa. The kinds of bees we have here in Canada are European derived bees. And the kind of bees they had in South America at that time had been European, but now have switched over to the African side. We call them Africanized because there's a little bit of hybridization between the European and African types. And the media nicknamed them killer bees because under some circumstances, they can be extraordinarily defensive. So there is a fear that if they arrived in America, they would just start killing people all over the fucking place. And they did eventually arrive in America. Yeah, somewhere in the early 1990s, the first colonies were found in, um, I believe it was in Texas. So obviously this didn't create the kind of nightmare scenarios that were imagined by these films. Why not? Why wasn't this as much of a disaster as some people seem to think it might be? I'd say the biggest reason is that we had a lot of advanced warning. You know, we had uh, 30 or 40 years to get used to the idea that the bees would arrive. And so public health officials were ready. Beekeepers were ready. The bees were not nearly as aggressive under many circumstances as they had been billed. And the southern United States is really the limit of their potential spread because they are a very tropical bee. And so we were working at the uh, edge of a hybridization zone where the European bees could do quite well and compete well against the African bees. Even in Latin America, although there were initially considerable panic and a fair number of stinging deaths, uh, the situation has calmed down quite a bit. Beekeepers have selected African bees that are much more, uh, that are much easier to work with, much less defensive. And the public knows now to stay away from honeybee nests. And so even in Latin America, the situation is quite a bit calmer. 
than it was back in the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s when the bees were still quite new and spreading rapidly. So in terms of the feral bee populations in the Americas, does it seem like they've mostly stabilized and where they are now is kind of where they're going to stay or is it still a population that's shifting and spreading? I think we're pretty much at the limit. The African honeybees are still spreading a little bit more northward. They more just recently were found just a little bit north of San Francisco. But uh, that's getting to pretty much the limit of where we expect them to spread. And uh, similarly in Latin America, their uh, spread is more or less stabilized. What was the reason for all the fear about the bees, in your opinion? What, what about the bees made them such a threat, or a perceived threat at least? Well, one reason was that beekeeping at that time was quite close to people. The beekeepers would keep their bees you know, in the villages where they lived. And um, with European bees, that was never a problem because they were quite calm. But the African bees, especially when the colonies to get to the large sizes needed for beekeeping, they can be extraordinarily aggressive at times. And um, there were incidents. It's very much like shark attacks. It happens rarely, but just because of the nature of the attack, it is truly terrifying. And I have been in situations where even though I'm fully protected with you know, a couple of layers of clothing and bee suits and veils and gloves and uh, boots and everything you can imagine, it's frightening when there are thousands and thousands of bees that are trying to sting you. And there have been massive stinging incidents. I think the world record is a fellow who got stung over 8,000 times by a, just an explosion of African bees. And so those rare situations provide the grist for um, the media to uh, you know, focus on the occasional horrific attack so I like the killer bee hysteria because it's really underlining the kind of fears and anxieties that I've already talked about environmental issues and about fear of a changing world and reactionary values. The fact that they're coming from the South too might have been part of the fear. Like I was watching an SNL skit when they have killer bees and they're all dressed as Mexican gangsters from a Western. Elliot Gould yeah, is their yeah. leader with like a sombrero and a mustache threatening people with a pistol. Do as I say, senor, your wife dies! Much the way Eli Wallach did in the movie The Magnificent Seven. The bees are also overweight. They're Turn their radio off! And danger. <laughs> Wait a minute. You must be the. That's right, gringo. <laughs> the killer bees! <laughs> So there might be some kind of cross wires there. Like there also was more immigration from the Southern countries into America at that time too. People may be worried about their stability and very aware of these environmental issues. And some convergence of these fears made people freak the fuck out about killer bees to the point where there was like five killer bee movies in four years, two of which we're going to be talking about. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I can see that Will is super excited about that. I don't know. I'll admit I'm feigning a bit more fatigue from it just because it's uh you know it's sexier to be mad at something that's why sheldon always comes off as so sexy in these podcasts oh do i have you not seen the fan fiction and the art made of you <laughs> <laughs> the ones you've made of me <laughs> although those can't be published. <laughs> mind over splatter slash fiction has really been heaten up uh, <laughs> we, we don't need that <laughs> okay the savage bees Came out in 1976. This, like Ants, was a made-for-TV movie. <laughs> this was an Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I love when you say that with the, with the exclamation mark in You have to. You were allowed, yeah, you have to. You're required to. Um, this script was also by Gordon Trueblood, the same guy who wrote the script for Ants, wrote The Savage Bees <laughs> as well. A different director, Bruce Geller, directed it. Bruce Geller is a big TV guy. He was the creator of the Mission Impossible series. So uh, the Savage Bees is about killer bees. They arrive in New Orleans just in time for Mardi Gras, of course. So a great disaster movie set up. Uh, it stars Michael Parks is uh, the main character here as like a coroner's assistant. But thankfully, he quickly gets out of the office and ends up traveling around and trying to save people. Uh, Michael Parks was, at the time, he was probably best known for the starring in the TV show, Then Came Bronson. He was a guy who kind of did like Western characters and biker characters. Better known today, surely, for playing Texas Ranger Earl McGraw 
the character he debuted in From Dust Till Dawn and then continued to chew tobacco and scenery throughout various Rodriguez and Tarantino movies. You know, he was in both Planet Terror and Death Proof. He was in the Kill Bill movies, always as McGraw, though he also in Kill Bill 2, he had a double role. He also played Esteban Viejo. So a great late career resurgence for an actor that I really like. I really like him in this movie. I think there's a vulnerability, there's a wounded aspect to him, but also kind of a cowboyish, thick-skulled, kind of dogged thing going on. And Ben Johnson, the great cowboy actor, older actor, is also in this too as a small-town sheriff. You got to have those small-town sheriffs in these movies. They're very important. Mm -hmm. Compared to like Ants, The Savage Bees is not as much like a thrill a minute movie. It doesn't have as much of the variety of different kind of scenes. Mostly, I feel like it's kind of coasting on Michael Park's charisma in terms of actually keeping me interested in it. (laughs) I do really like the way that they wrap it up. The climax. The climax is so weird and unique. When they have like a bunch of bees covering a car the entire colony of killer bees are covering one car and this car has to be slowly driven through new orleans to get to the football stadium so that they can get it in the football stadium and then lower the temperature to the point where the bees die (laughs) it it has fun tension and it's like just such a weird unique climax that plays out at very slow (laughs) speeds so kind of like the climax in ants actually which ends up with just people just sitting very still we have like this very slow (laughs) speed the opposite of a car chase and it kept (laughs) on like saying we can't lose a single bee we got to do this precise whatever you're gonna lose bees well the idea is that the colony is like all clings together because they're so pissed off that they, that they all attack as I, one. I, I know, but <laughs> you're going to lose a couple bees on the way there. And, and they do because there was a sequel. There is a sequel called Terror Out of the Sky. <laughs> <laughs> so they did not get every beat. I, I thought this one's all right, mostly because of the climax, because of Michael Parks. Decent movie, decent distillation of Fear of the Bees you know, just this panic of these buzzing, insistent swarms make for some decent scenes. I found it pretty pretty enjoyable to watch. Yeah. It was really slow at times, but as you get to the conclusion, it's pretty pretty damn entertaining. I guess it's your turn. Do you have your egg cream ready, Sheldon? <laughs> <laughs> the audible exhale. Squirm, 1976. Hmm. Hold on a second. Let me get my egg cream. Okay, okay I'm going to make another one. Hold on. For fuck's sake. No, wait. You're not actually doing it? You're just saying Okay. No, okay. I'm not anymore. I already gave up on it. I made <laughs> one to start the, the thing. I was going to mention it at the beginning <laughs> when you fucking mentioned it. Uh, I'd like a large egg cream and a glass of water, please. <laughs> well, I've got water, but what did you say? An egg cream? <laughs> An egg cream. It's uh, just chocolate syrup, a little milk, and some seltzer water. A chocolate soda. That's it. With just a little shot of milk to give it a hit. I, I never thought that you would do the same thing. Really? You didn't think I would drink on the show? I mean, it's not even an alcoholic drink. I put vodka in it. Yeah, I put bourbon in mine. Like, my idea's gone, and that's all I have written down for Squirm. Egg cream. <laughs> <laughs> me too when i was watching the movie the, the thing that i had to do most was like go google egg cream as soon as it ended because i had to know is that a real thing do people actually drink that so we got squirm from 1976 mm-hmm. uh this one stars i think basically no one <laughs> like of note right yeah. no it almost did it almost had um kim basinger <laughs> yeah. and martin sheen were both um turned down couldn't make the cut. This one's set in a southern town with like a long distance relationship. The one dude's coming in from the city, which they make note of many times. <laughs> yeah. And the town becomes then infested with millions and millions of worms, carnivorous worms that come up from the ground after, from what I think was an electrical storm that broke down the power wires that then landed into like a swamp. I guess electrocuted ground and then the worms came up. Then I have What the Fuck is Egg Cream? We went into that already. <laughs> Welcome to the Egg Cream episode of My Over Splatter. <laughs> is that the sponsor? That's basically the plot of the movie. Uh, the city slicker dude who came in took it upon himself to figure out what's happening in this town with these odd deaths that have been going around. And there's a subplot with a jealous... Just a simple southerner. There's a subplot of him who gets attacked early on in the movie. They're out fishing and he gets attacked by the worms that they were using as bait. 
which was a pretty cool practical effect scene where the worms go up into his skin and his in his face. A super cool scene. And yeah. they stay there the entire rest of the movie. So as the movie's going along, this guy's constantly chasing the main characters along with the worms. And it seems like he kind of becomes one with the worms. Because mm-hmm. the worms are carnivorous and they're biting people. And at some point, he bites the main actor. So I kind of assumed he was part of their colony. I don't know. Maybe he was so simple-minded they accepted him. So yeah, I I like this movie a lot. Oh, I should also mention that, as with basically all these movies, the the close-up scenes of the uh, insect were just like fucking screaming worms as if they were like yelling at you, which would blow out my speakers every time it happened. (laughs) And they have these weird... I don't know if they're real worms. I don't know what the fuck those things were. No, they were real. Those are worms? Those are a, a type of worm, yeah. Creepy little buggers. They are... Well, they're worms in the sense that they're annelids, which is the worm family. They're not earthworms, of course. There's two species they use in the movie. They use sandworms and bloodworms. Those are the common American names for them. Yeah, mentioned in the movie. So these are like mostly marine creatures. You can find them on beaches and stuff. Sandworms, I've seen from time to time. I see them on the beaches around here. And they can give you a pretty nasty bite. They won't break the skin, but they can give you a good pinch. So yeah, they have those strong pinchers coming out of their faces. Uh, Hmm. Sorry, I'm doing my worm fact zone right now. No, I'm I'm very curious about that because I'm like... What the fuck is that creature? The, the reddish ones, the blood worms, they're proboscis. Those are the ones that has like four prongs to it that like sticks out on a little like kind of a xenomorph kind of thing. And um, they can hold more copper in their bodies than most animals can. And their little jaws are mostly made out of copper, which is kind of weird. And they've got a really strong bite too. So do the sandworms. Sandworms can grow up to four feet. Blood worms have up to two feet. So they can get pretty fucking big. These are some big fucking worms. They're basically tremors. Yeah. Wow. You want to know what the longest worm is? There's a, a giant earthworm in Africa that can be 22 feet long. Holy Ooh. fuck. There's my worm fact zone. Sorry, keep going. There's a weird thing where the boyfriend coming into town, you're thrown off by how dorky this dude is, and you kind of hope he's not a main character, and then he ends up being the main character. But man, did he look good with his shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like the tone of this movie. It has such a weird special tone. It's not mm-hmm. like quite an outright comedy, but it has like a kind of grinning tone where they're really indulging in enjoying like awkward moments and weird, unexpected lines of dialogue. They're really kind of leading into the fun, awkward strangeness of every scene, which I like. It kind of reminded me of the tone of like a Russ Myers movie. Uh, it seems to just be really enjoying itself. Uh, written and directed by Jeff Lieberman who also made Blue Sunshine after this. You guys know Blue Sunshine? I do not. It's like a a psychedelic horror movie about a bad batch of acid, and it kicks ass. Okay. And that effect you underlined of the worms crawling into the face is an amazing effect shot. Incredible stuff. This is probably my favorite of the bunch of the ones we discussed today. Okay, tip in your hand. A little different from the others. It's not clenching its jaw and taking on a serious disaster movie tone. It's really exploitation. It's having fun being in a small town in the south with like unique, weird, and creepy characters. All right, should we uh, buzz back into B-Zone? I'm stoked for the grand finale. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we finally get to the swarm, I need to check back in with B-expert Mark L. Winston. I recall really vividly coming back from South America after our research, first research stint in French Guiana. We came back at just about the exact time that the movie The Swarm came out. And uh, we had T-shirts made up that said Killer Bee Team for the four or five of us that were working down there together. And when the movie came out, we went to the opening night in Lawrence, Kansas, which is where I went to school. And we had the um, hope that the theater would be packed. And we would walk in wearing our T-shirts and just make a big, big splash in the audience. So we got all dressed up in our T-shirts, went to the theater, walked in. There was virtually nobody there. (laughs) All the Killer Bee movies have been incredible flops. Even that one, which had uh, a huge array of Hollywood stars. It just closed after a couple of weeks because it was was just a really, really bad movie. (laughs) Yeah. and the same thing with the Savage Bees. You know, they're, they're all just really, really bad movies. So we walked in and just nothing happened. And we were terribly disappointed. <laughs> That's great. I love it. So on to the Academy Award nominated film. <laughs> this 
1978 disaster horror film, The Swarm. Yeah. Which, I mean, those familiar with the lists of the most infamous films out there should be well acquainted with The Swarm. It has appeared on many a worst film ever made list. I guess because it had a big budget. It had actual stars. Went to the theater? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like I said, this, like, it was directed and produced by Irwin Allen, who was the producer of things like The Poseidon Adventure, The Towering Inferno. So, I mean, like... The Master of Disaster. Major pedigree of disaster films. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it got... uh, an Oscar nomination for costume design. I'll admit, I this is the only one I didn't see of the list, and I, oh, I'm really excited to hear how good it is. Uh, the film opens right off with an investigative team are going through this high security level base. Uh, as they're going through, they're not sure if it's been infiltrated by enemy forces, a disease, or what. They're fully hazmatted out, plus guns out. And they go through and they find corpses strewn everywhere. Corpses, I will note... That don't have a single scratch on them. They all look like they just were suddenly attacked by naps. Inside of this facility is one civilian, Dr. Bradford Crane. Michael Kane. Mr. Michael Kane. Mm. I will not bother another Batman. <laughs> who does a fair bit of scenery chewing in this. Uh, he, he does his commanding Cockney yell monologue at one point. He, he... At one point or at seven points? Well, I mean, there's one in particular where you can see the veins in his neck. Like, yeah. he's really giving it to him. But there's, yeah, there's a few times, like, he's got an unending sense of condescension. Like, right off the bat, he's just kind of walks in smugly. So, he knows what's happening. He knows that there's a enormous swarm of killer bees. And uh, as we heard facts from before, these are the same bees that people were panicking about. They stop referring to them as bees after a while, and they simply want to, quote, kill the Africans or stop the Africans. They really <laughs> emphasize just how Africanized these bees are in their their weaponized swarmness. We get to uh, this quaint little southern town that's about to have their flower festival because the quaint festival had actually ended. So they're going on to the next one, which is the flower festival. And uh, we get to see people having picnics. Uh, there's this charming elderly love triangle between the a, a, a retired mechanic the school principal and the mayor uh the mayor played by fred mcmurray just you know in case people wanted to see that delightful character actor die this is his final role yeah and also speaking of uh, ben johnson again also in here Ben Johnson. In both our B-movies. And there's so many, like, Slim Pickens is in here. Like, this is a proper roster. There's a lot of... Fucking Henry Fonda is in here. Henry Fonda. And <laughs> that's just the old folks. Oh, and that's not all the old folks. Olivia de Havilland is in here. Uh, and then the, yeah. the younger stars, Catherine Ross. Yeah, Richard Chamberlain as as the younger doc. Mm, Patty Duke. The stack is mm-hmm. fucking bursting with stars. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's just loaded. A major symptom of once you're stung by them, it's a, a sign that the venom is coursing through your veins is that you see a giant bee in front of you. I love that. I love the bee hallucinations. <laughs> so good. It's, how, bi- how big is a bee? Like, what do they use? A- bigger than a man, usually. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, it's like the whole room is like he sees a big bee. <laughs> like a zoomed in <laughs> graphic of a regular bee just. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, they mat it into the room. So like Exactly, he's matted in there. It's that must look really good. Oh yeah, it's clearly being held by like tweezers or something as you <laughs> see it like kind of semi-struggling. And then Michael Caine's just like, reach out to the bait. So that's the thing that people have to look forward to. So you know, like no one's safe. If you get stung by at least two bees, you know you're in danger of dying. Like you will recover, but then for some reason you'll get the sweats, see a giant bee and die. But I mean, not to say that there's other ways other people don't die. Like uh, Fred McMurray's tossed from a train. We have, <laughs> uh, you know, we see Ben Johnson go through glass. Henry Fonda dies in a completely needless experiment where he's trying to see if his self-made antidote works. So he gives himself six times the uh, venom. So it didn't work? Yeah, he, and he's doing a voice recording and like for posterity in case it doesn't work. And he's like, I've compiled all my notebooks so you can replicate in case I die. Dude, if we yeah. die, we don't want your antidote. It doesn't yeah, work. Exactly. If you die, it doesn't work. And it doesn't. <laughs> also, the fact that there's the, like these romances just come out of goddamn left field every which way in this film. 
And there's a whole, like, there's a whole side stories of a woman who has like a child and you see her and like, she starts to recover and then she's like going out of the hospital. Uh, but then she starts to go into labor. So they bring her back to the hospital and she has the child. And her doctor's and, in love with her. Like, yeah, they fall in love too. So I don't know if that's like a symptom. Like it's just left and right. People are falling in love. There's for some reason, there's a nuclear plant in driving distance to this place. And of course the bees get in there and somehow within minutes that leads to a complete meltdown and explosion killing thousands and the like the remainder of the town who didn't get evacuated although most of the evacuees are killed because the train is derailed by bees how'd they manage that there's a lot of them (laughs) they get at the engineers and then the engineers like set the train into like overdrive and so it just it takes a corner too fast because there's bees Fucking bees, eh? The same way the nuclear power plant gets exploded, right? Bees are just attacking somebody, <laughs> then somebody falls into a lever, and then it's like, oh, okay, there you go, then. <laughs> yeah. The nuclear power plant, it's like within a, a two minutes yeah. of just like, oh no, the bees are in here, too. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what the hell? Uh, I will give kudos to a lot of the stunt people. There was a shitload of stunts that were pretty, pretty, pretty great, like, especially the ones involving hordes and hordes of bees there's a lot of like children actors just lying around and having to be completely mummified in bees i i tip my hat to them those are actual bees a lot of people covered in bees jumping through windows and cars and things they do find a way to get that environmental message in and one part that i did appreciate where uh, the military solution of course is just to either nuke it all or just gas them all and kill every every single thing. And Michael Caine argues like, well, that would kill every single bee, not just the killer bees. And bees are necessary for humankind's survival. He's, he's very worked up about that. He's incredibly worked up. The honeybee is vital to the environment. Every year in America, they pollinate $6 billion worth of crops. If you kill the bee, you're going to kill the crop. If you kill the plant, you'll kill the people. No! No, General! fair point but at the same time it's not like they're going to gas the world if they gas a town in texas it's not like well you know then how will the rest of the world survive without these bees I'm like i'm sure they have their own um, yeah i really struggle to understand actually michael kane's insistent refusal to use pesticides early on okay yeah. some crop yields fail like 230 people die right after that like th- I, I know some farmers will lose money Give them disaster relief. They're not dead, at least. I will not bury another bee. <laughs> I've already buried 15 bees. I will not bury another one, Master Wayne. <laughs> you can't kill the bees. You're only supposed to blow the bloody wings off. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we find out later that the pesticides don't work, but that yeah. by that point... But we didn't know that, yeah. It's barely an anecdote at that point. And then they thank the military in the credits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, thanks for the participation of the military. I'm like, well, yeah, I definitely didn't have scientists sitting around giving you notes. <laughs> but they sure knew how to fly that helicopter. People yelling the situation they're in, though, and all the recordings was hysterical, though. I love where they're just like flying helicopters like, ah, bees, there's hundreds of bees. Just like every black box everywhere is just people hollering, ah, there's lots of bees. And then they die. <laughs> So yeah, the swarm, and it's two and a half hours long. Oh, it's a whole lot of movie. So when Sir Michael Caine, for me, probably his greatest quote is, you might know where I'm going with this, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm considering doing the worst Michael Caine accent ever, and I'm drunk Go enough to do, to do it. it. Talking about Joss for the Revenge, which he's in, he oh, says, yeah, great movie. Oh, I've never seen the film, but by all accounts, it was terrible. However, I've seen the house that I built, and that is terrific. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I like how your Michael Caine's a bit Australian. You have sort of an Australian Michael Caine. Good day there, Master Wayne. <laughs> hey, having a plane a bit of the old cricket then. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the super villain today? Another crocodile, is it? Should I handle him, Master Wayne? <laughs> Quah, that's a lot of bees. <laughs> I hope he was able to build like a whole manor or a villa with uh, with what he was paid for the swarm. And yeah, the cast absolutely stacked. Uh, almost nobody really kind of comes out of this without some shit on their face. Kane manages okay. And like you mentioned, Henry Fonda is not bad. The relationship between Kane and Fonda was the one relationship in the movie that I thought actually worked. 
Yeah. Of course, the real stars were the bees. 20 million bees were apparently used in this movie, more or less. Holy fuck. 100 people were employed just to wrangle bees. And of those bees, 800,000 bees had their stingers removed so that they were harmless. So somebody was removing stingers from 800,000 bees or a team (laughs) of people, probably. So yeah, this had a huge fucking budget. This was a major movie. I mean, like Will mentioned, it's Irwin Allen. He's the master of disaster. Uh, So this has a script by Sterling Siliphant, who also wrote Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno. But unlike those movies, Irwin Allen chose to direct this film himself. And by all available evidence, terrible choice. Like, like not that there aren't some moments that I thought were like cool choices. Like when Michael Caine gives his first big rant and they have the cameras rotating around the two characters and it's just one long rotating camera take that goes on for like minutes and minutes. Cool concept, like cool idea. But Mm -hmm. based on the scenes that we have here, I have to conclude that Irwin Allen has no idea how to direct actors. Nobody seems to be on the same page. A lot of the takes are left really long, too. So the actors just seem to be floundering out there in those long takes, like just not sure what to do. Almost everybody seems like weirdly off their beats. The scenes have very stilted energy to them. Every scene of dialogue is stilted, basically. I mean, Michael Caine doesn't come off too bad despite that, but that's mostly just because he's fucking Michael Caine in his prime and then he can kind of do no wrong. I do like how his role here kind of um, is a, a great example of something that I enjoy about these 70s natural horror movies, which is that we have the scientists becoming the heroes. And I think mm. this is also really in the wake of the environmental mm. movement and the fact that we're moving away from the 50s and 60s creature feature era, which are really kind of Cold War inflected movies where the heroes are almost always military figures. And the scientists, if they're not outright villains, they're kind of weird creeps and they maybe turn into like worshiping the monster at the end and have to be killed by it or something. In the 70s, we start to move into movies like this where you can have the scientist who is kind of the main hero and the military guys kind of take a back seat. So the military guys are hardly not heroic, but for most of the movie, it's clear that Michael Caine's character is right. And it's fun to see the scientist character in the new seventies mold where he gets to be kind of a sexy dude. You know, he's not some dude with thick glasses and like a German accent or something wearing a lab coat. I mean, he, he, he does have like patches on his elbows and wears turtlenecks. So there's gestures towards <laughs> the professorial style, but still he's, he's got a real like modern hip seventies look, you know, Michael Caine's got his huge thick head of hair. He's got sideburns that look each one like an entire animal pelt. That's a great example of these movies, elevating the scientists to the hero role, like getting away from post-war anxieties more into more into environmental issues where we actually do see the scientists as the ones who are right, who have the, the correct ideas, who could help guide us through this mess. And uh, and what a mess it is. I, I'd never seen this movie before. Weirdly, I'd never even, I wasn't even aware of this movie, even though I love 70s disaster films. This had just escaped my radar. And Honestly, I'm super grateful that I've just been introduced to what has to be the most absolute fucking weird big budget (laughs) 70s disaster movie ever made. It has to be like, this is a strange movie between the stilted scenes and the weird shit that goes down, like all that stuff that Will mentioned. But you also didn't mention the climax is just like a bunch of flamethrowers in like a hotel and the bees are attacking guys with flamethrowers, flamethrowers everywhere. And they start burning the building down with flamethrowers going all over the fucking place. It's crazy. It's wild shit. I don't know why those suits weren't bee proof. Like why the people ended up going in hysterics and they like run inside their own facility. Flamethrower is still going, <laughs> letting all the bees in, just screaming and dying. Like what? It's worth pointing out that the bees in this movie are supposed to be mutated bees. So they're not yeah. just regular Africanized honeybees. They make a point of the fact that they're like mutants or like another evolution. They say at one point, so their venom is more powerful. So this is just like, taking the anxiety about killer bees and just fucking turning that dial past 11. It's at 16 or something like just like, well, I mean, you're blowing up a fucking nuclear reactor at one point. (laughs) Like It goes so (laughs) over the top and crazy. When, when Michael Cage shows up, he refers to the bees as a force far more lethal than any human force. As if like, 
this is worse than all the nuclear weapons in the world. Like they really imply that humanity is going to potentially go extinct because of these bees. The final yeah, message they have of the more movie, than one line of dialogue where it's like, I never thought it would be bees that took over. Like they imply that this could be like Armageddon for humans. Even at the end, after they destroy the colonies, they're like, maybe, maybe if we change our ways, we might be able to survive. So it's just an insane exaggeration of the killer bee hysteria this is a good way to end the episode because the swarm is like everything we've been talking about but just cranked up with a huge budget but um i was grinning for pretty much the entire runtime of this movie i had a good time watching it oh you liked it i i really appreciated discovering it okay Mm -hmm. would i say it's a good well-made movie fuck no (laughs) <laughs> but it's a spectacle it's a hell of a thing it's a hell of an artifact from that era yeah it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a wild thing to exist so will i kind of took it that you didn't like a lot of these movies i feel like you're being the sheldon here will you're being the grump just just shitting on all these movies i'm allowed to be the grump when you give me shitty movies to watch <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm because i'm not as wild like i get that you know it seems like a weird thing to say when we're a, a horror podcast but i'm not always into the overwhelming pessimism. I appreciate it sometimes when it's really well crafted. Like first thing that comes to mind is the thing. Like that's so, it's almost like nihilist. Like it's just, there's, there's no hope, but it's so well crafted. Whereas with these, like really getting to know people that were nice and deserve better and then watching them die torturously. It's not unlike the sins made by films that go past the slasher genre into the torture porn kind of thing. The Swarm, admittedly, yeah, it's a crazy relic of a strange time. I tut it because it's just this overblown, bloated, high-budget bit of nonsense. Like, I'll forgive, like, lower-budget things, putting something interesting out there. And a lot of them were fun. Like, the made-for-TV movies. Those are my favorite ones. Be. Like, I love yeah. Ants. Ants! Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> So, Sheldon, your favorite of the one we've discussed is Ants. Oh, sorry, Ants! Is that right? <laughs> I, I really like both the ones I discussed. Like, they're both, for me, just super fun. I think Phase 4, for me, was my least favorite of the group. Yeah, I want to, like, pimp the tires of Ants a little bit more because I didn't expect to have a, a script that I enjoyed as much as I did or because it was, like, an ABC movie of the week or whatever the fuck. Like, I literally haven't seen this movie since... Maybe I was 12, 13, and I couldn't really find it anywhere until when we discussed this episode. I was like, I think that's the movie I watched as a child that I really liked. And I had the same enjoyment watching it. No, I was surprised by that. I would go with Phase 4 as as my favorite, though. It's it's more in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. I like the strangeness, the striking visuals, the kind of ruminative tone. It's more the kind of thing that I dig. Yeah, you normally like bad movies, so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I give all my accolades to Myrna Loy. Myrna Loy wins. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Fuck you, Olivia de Havilland. Get out of here. There's something about these 70s movies, the kind of integration of the environmentalism with disaster movie ideas that works better, I think, in these. And when you get into like 90s movies, like the 80s are really good, too, for this. Yeah, though, I feel like, you know, when you get into like Reagan era movies, they're less friendly towards people who want to save the environment and, and scientists. And we, we start returning to the 50s and 60s stereotypes of like dorky scientists who are either mm-hmm. evil or useless. The hybrid we have in the 70s is, um, is something special. Fuck, there's so many. Many. I haven't seen a lot of them. Thank you, Sheldon Kilcullen, William O'Donnell, and of course, our special appearance by Mark L. Winston. Check out his works. His most recent book is called Listening to the Bees. Thanks for listening to my Dover Splatter. Uh, let us know what you'd like this to cover in the future. Oh, we've got our 10th episode coming up soon. Maybe we'll try to do something special for our 10th episode, so stay tuned for that. Don't Have a good night, everyone. Forever. Keep looking behind you. There might be some bees. Could it bring the unknown that we've never seen before? Oh, let the sky be blue tomorrow, just like it is today.
All right. Any yeah. any final thoughts on bugs, you guys? Any egg cream recipes you want to share? Just oh, you fucking 